thanks again for joining us this evening. I'm Johnny from Stir to Action. Um, and this webinar is part of two webinars that we're doing with the Hive, with COPS UK, um, as part of a series about building more awareness of co-ops with different and new audiences. Tonight's event's called What Future? Co-ops and Youth Unemployment. Um, I'm gonna start with a kind of quick introduction of this evening's panel, um, as we'll be finding out more about their work over kind of the next hour. Um, Yeva is a filmmaker who's based in London, working at the Blake House Cooperative. Martin Johnston is part of Chapel Street Studios and Bread and Roses, a publishing and co-working space in Bradford. And I'm Johnny Gordon Farley, part of Stir to Action, which is an educational and training body um, supporting co-ops and community businesses. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, can you have your mic on mute if you're not speaking um, as part of the discussion? Again, just be aware that we're recording, um, so just be conscious if you need to turn your camera off. Um, we're recording so that those that can join us tonight, um, yeah, can basically catch up. So we're gonna be sharing the video as part of a kind of follow-up email. Tonight's webinar has been funded by The Hive, which is a support program um, delivered by COPS UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. Um, we'll share more information about the Hive in a follow-up email along with a link to the video and more information about Stir to Action and some of the information that we'll talk about tonight, which is relevant. Um, if, if there is anything that you hear tonight, mention of any kind of networks or business programs that you want more information on, then please do drop that into the chat box um, and we'll go through the, the, the chat record afterwards and pick up some of that stuff when we populate that email to send out to you. So just quickly, not gonna to say too much at the start, um, but basically latest analysis is suggesting that one million young people could face a job crisis in a matter of weeks as the furlough scheme ends this weekend and they're faced with a new scarcity of, of, of jobs in the economy. And at the same time, we know that the government schemes that are available at the moment are superficial, temporary, and may alleviate in the short term, but are not gonna eliminate the problems of our economy. So the idea for this evening's event is that we're here stories from three cooperative businesses um, that were started in the kind of shadow of the last economic crisis, um, where young people turn to co-ops as a way to create decent work and alternative careers for themselves after most entry level and graduate jobs were turned into precarious short term or zero hour contracts. Um, Yeva, Martin and I have worked together over the last four to five years. So we're gonna kind of, instead of doing more Zoom presentations, which I'm sure you're all exhausted by, we thought we'd kind of do some kind of informal interviewing to find out more about our co-ops, motivations for starting them, um, the networks that we've been part of, the business support we've got, the support that we might have needed and things that you know we might have done differently now five years kind of into running our businesses. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna start and we, we're going to go around um, starting with Yeva, just asking, yeah, why did you start a co-op? Over to Yeva. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so um, I'm Yeva, and uh, I work in a filmmaker's uh, cooperative of Blake House. Um, and uh, we started in 2014. Um, I was a recent graduate um, uh, and uh, I really struggled to get into a film industry. I finished a film degree as you do. And uh, um, it was uh, very difficult to uh, get a job. I didn't uh, get anything through like normal routes. I got um, uh, a job in um, a TV series uh, on a short two week contract through friends. And uh, I find it, found it very difficult because so I have a weird name, I guess, that people couldn't really remember on a busy, busy set. So we kind of, myself and other people, young people in the film industry kind of saw that if you're kind of, um, don't have immediate connections, you kind of just are a girl or hey guy, hey you type thing. And uh, we kind of became very disillusioned with um, actually making it an industry and actually not really enjoying what the industry was um because it was very um intense working 14 hour days and uh, um just kind of didn't find much meaning in it uh, as well and uh, we 
figured that we should try starting something ourselves. Um, and uh, we set up a playhouse, I think because primarily because we were so disillusioned with the industry, um, uh, the, the kind of precarious nature of it, zero hour contracts, having to find a job, spending two months finding a job, then working for a week or two and, or, or a day, then spending the next few months finding another gig. Um, and I guess film industry is uh, also very competitive and uh, um, the commercial nature of the jobs that um, I was getting um, didn't feel right, just seeing how everyone around me was struggling as well. And uh, I had a very uh, strong dip in confidence um, uh, in that um, I thought that it was my fault that I wasn't getting a job, that like I wasn't like, talented enough or um, uh, just wasn't suitable for a job. But then I saw also um, uh, other people from my university that did really well at university. And I thought they were really talented, also struggling, kind of falling asleep uh, at a wheel just from the um, kind of really um, long shifts and, and that sort of thing. and. Um, we were looking to create an alternative to what the industry was. So initially we didn't know anything about cooperatives. So myself and Simon, uh, who was also from my university, we um, kind of back engineered a workers cooperative in that we had bad experiences with bosses and uh, we thought that it doesn't really make sense to have someone um, to kind of like have so much control over your uh, uh, livelihood. Um, so we wanted to create flat structure, things like that. And then eventually we um, found out about worker cooperatives that had uh, cooperative principles and values, a whole structure based on democracy, on, um, uh, on values of mutual aid. And uh, yeah, that's how uh, we met uh, Johnny and Martin. Cool, thanks, Yeva. Martin, do you wanna, yeah, do you wanna give your backstory to, to starting Chapel Street and, and then Bread and Roses? Uh, yeah, my, my opening gambit is that I was 24 when I started my own private business and then 26 when we started our cooperative. I don't know, you guess how old I am now. But um, basically we were a, a group of people in Bradford all, um, freelancing or doing our own projects or running our own small businesses uh, that came together as a cooperative consortium um, which would represent us all and provide us all a, a kind of home and a place where we could come back combine our resources so we had graphic designers and at the time I was publishing a magazine and we were running marketing promotions and we were going to bring people together in Bradford. There wasn't a creative workspace in Bradford. So we, we were the first to start to bring bring that together. And that's really the start of our journey um, into co-ops. Um, I had a background because I lived in a radical roots housing co-op in Bradford called The Hive. Some of you may know about it because I see there's some radical roots people in the room. Um, <clears throat> And really, it was about um, one of the things about our cooperative is that we all wanted to retain our own independence in what we were all doing, um, rather than forming a larger organisation. And but at the same time, we were all in this kind of similar position where we felt that we needed to combine our, our talents and our resources and and, and um, really bringing bringing everyone up together, creating opportunities for ourselves and others in Bradford. Um, and um, the two forms we've now got to is we have a creative agency that we used on collaborative projects for bigger, bigger opportunities that we can't take as individuals. We've got about 20 members now um, in that. So that's called Chapel Street Studio. And then um, from having a couple of spaces uh, over the years, we formed Bread and Roses in 2018, which is a community owned or cooperative and community owned um, workspace and cafe in the city centre of Bradford. Uh, at that time we, we, we evolved our membership to include our community as well so we're actually for the benefit of our members and the community 
which uh, was a crafty move in order to go down the power to change gravy train. <laughs> but also uh, the thing of inclusion, which is everything we're about, um, we're kind of in between a, a, a worker co-op, a freelancer co-op, and now a, a community co-op. So that was very much kind of like we're for our members and for Bradford. Um, a big drive was always the thing for Bradford. So um, that's me and who I am. Um, and I'm interested in hearing what other people have to contribute and uh, sharing on what I can share from my perspective as being a young, young cooperator, um, starting out and then meeting other young cooperators. Um, so it might be cool, John, if you tell us a little bit about the Young Cooperators Prize and subsequent network that we try to get off the ground. Um, uh, and then take yeah. it from there, I don't know. Yeah, and, and just quickly before that, in terms of kind of backstory for, for Stir to Action, um, like personally kind of quite heavily involved in different forms of social activism. So from like working with the homeless in cities like Bristol, kind of when I was 15, 16. Um, and then I kind of got into, into youth work. So I moved to London when I was 17 and moved in with an African family um, that had a church on an estate in Bethnal Green. And yeah, we decided to set up a youth club and basically walked around this estate, handing out flyers. And then suddenly 125 children turned up to a really, really small youth centre in on this estate, I had a football pitch and a youth centre. And we'd basically been to cash converters to get a PlayStation and a table tennis table. And yeah, there were three of us having to look after and manage 125 children from the estate. Um, so kind of completely thrown in, in with the fire there. Um, and I was quite fresh faced kind of coming from the, the rural Southwest into East London. Um, but that really kind of inspired my journey working kind of young adults. I, I came back to Dorset and kind of worked in a, a shed factory for, for six months painting sheds. And then I got an internship in Brooklyn, New York um, to work with five to 18 year olds. And I spent nine months there and that was a year and a half after 9-11. So kind of city was still, yeah, still quite shaken. Um, it was Mayor Rudy Giuliani. There was lots of zero tolerance. So that period between leaving school and going home for dinner was one of the kind of the most high risk times for young people to get arrested um, so our kind of job was keeping young people occupied between leaving school and, and getting home for dinner. Um, and I think one of the really big kind of takeaways from that work was just had this kind of sense that whilst it was kind of remedial and kind of working with people where they were, it wasn't transformative in terms of changing the local environment in which these young people lived. And one of the definitions that I always like to, to talk about our work at the moment is um, kind of around community economic development, which is, which I use for co-ops too, which is, it's, it's not about supporting individuals um, to function better in their current environment, but to support the transformation of that underlying economy, which is causing and it, many of those problems which be, being expressed in different ways. That's kind of, you know, in, in being involved in gang activity, that's mental health issues, if it's unemployment, a whole range of things like that. So I kind of, I think through my kind of social activism and kind of working through youth charities, I kind of, I came out of it and I was like, there must be something which, yeah, has a view, however, however ambitious, ambitious it is to kind of work towards actually transforming the economy. And that led me to, led me to co-ops through, mainly through starting a, an online magazine called stirtoaction.com which was back in 2011 now, inspired by lots of things like the Occupy movement. Of course, you know, there was lots of student organizing at the time. Um, you had the student protest at the end of 2010. Um, and of course the economic crisis really kind of overshadowed and of course inspired a lot of the kind of economic activism around that time. And co-ops were, you know, something that were being kind of put forward through that work. Um, and that's kind of, yeah. Kind of where I started to take an interest in it. And just to quickly say, I founded Stir to Action um, and largely it was me for a couple of years. And then we started taking on new people and we actually incorporated properly as a co-op only about three years ago now. 
Um, so we kind of function as a kind of informal cooperative business. Um, um, I don't know if anybody, you know, you ever might have something to say about legal structures, but just to say we're a limited company um, by guarantee. And actually a large proportion of co-ops in the UK are not what we call societies, which is a very specific legal structure for co-ops, but often used um, the limited by guarantee model. It's what you might call a legal hack, a really easy, cheap way of setting up a co-op and then kind of capturing the kind of cooperative structure and, and kind of what are called secondary rules in your, in your constitution. Um, so yeah, so that's my kind of backstory and there's lots more there, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of where, you know, still kind of our view on co-ops. Why did you want to do it as a cooperative, Johnny, and not um, a, a more private community benefit kind of company or anything like that? Yeah, it's it, what's really interesting is that I went I went back through some email trails back to when we launched the magazine, and I sent out this email to about fifty people, being like, "Want to start a co-op? Who wants to be involved?" and got no responses. So it was it was always there from the start. And a lot of my, as many people, I guess, that kind of start businesses is kind of, let's get on with it. And that was the kind of attitude was kind of, let's get on with it. And um, that's why it kind of started as, you know, a more kind of traditional initiative. But that was, that was kind of always there intuitively within the work, which is why over the years. And of course, I mean, one really important thing to say is we be really became a co-op when Sturt of Action could start paying wages, right? Um, could actually create jobs. Um, it's, it's not impossible. And of course, it's the way that many co-ops start, which is, hey, three, four, five other people, do you want to start a co-op? There's quite a lot of sweat, um, sweat labor that goes into it. Um, nobody's going to get paid for a bit, but we're going to try and see what we can do in six to nine months and let's see if this thing's flying and, and we're paying ourselves. Yeah. Um, and of course, yeah, that, that was quite important that we got to the scale where we were creating jobs and we could start paying people. That, yeah, that's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you engineered a co-op, you started on your own, you needed, you, you wanted people because obviously in, in its DNA, the cooperative is, I think the, the definition, the international definition of co-op is an association of people uh, that come together for common purpose or something like that. Yeah, you can't have a co-op, just, just you. But it's interesting that you went about looking to start a co-op, just you. And uh, I'm kind of curious to know where that came from, how you discovered co-ops or why you decided I'm going to make a co-op. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, interestingly, maybe Yeva could jump in on this because um, I know that Yeva's talked about this idea of kind of co-ops of one. Puritan, pur Puritan. Uh, yeah. so could, you, could you explain that a little bit, Yeva? Kind of. Yeah. Um, so I like, when I discovered cooperatives, I was so angry that I never heard of them before. <laughs> I was so angry. I was like, why the hell? This is not the how we like run things, right? It's like, why we have these insane models that just extract things to shareholders. And uh, like, this is like, democ like we spend thirds of our lives at work. And mm -hmm. like, we we don't have democracy at work like that's insane but so um i discovered uh, cooperatives for the first time in a really roundabout way um uh, around the time when we were <laughs> trying to kind of like write very intense artist manifestos to start this alternative film industry model that was run on democracy and um we were like we thought that we were we were inventing something we came across article by david graber um, on bullshit jobs, which was uh, um, published in Strike magazine, and uh, we read it, and it was a bit of a moment where it's like, oh my god, we're not crazy, like we're not just like two people um, trying to like do something that we never heard about before. This is actually like we we like others think like that, others feel like that, that they're like they're up against it. Um, and they don't want to compete, that we didn't want to compete with our friends. We wanted to work together and make, make useful stuff. Um, and, uh, and so discovering that Strike Magazine was a workers' cooperative, they had posted the 
uh, on their website, um, worker cooperative principles and values, seven principles and values. And uh, we were like, oh, this is sorted. This is manifesto written. Like it's, it, it all kind of checks out. Um, and after that, we kind of like, I, I, I particularly started kind of like campaigning a lot around kind of just going and complaining everywhere. Um, uh, why, why we don't know about cooperatives, <laughs> why I didn't know about cooperatives. Um, and, and so um, I spent quite a few years when we, when we were starting out just kind of, I was invited to give a couple of speeches at some events, uh, 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 at some conferences, et cetera. And I was just like, I'm only talking here because like, I have, haven't heard about cooperatives. Why you all here <laughs> didn't tell me that there were cooperatives? Why you don't tell other people who are like, just like, working on zero hour contracts uh, on temporary contracts on kind of like uh, having to like you know prove pr work extra hours and not claim it just to kind of like not be sacked and things like that and uh, and so we started talking a lot with the um, with the johnny and others in a uh, young cooperators kind of circle um uh, that uh, you know everyone should be able to start a cooperative and i started it with uh, simon so it was like two of us initially it's uh, um so it it kind of like we thought that it's about principles it's about the 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 values and uh, and um, the structure that you want to run this organization as a dem democratically with others so for us, it was kind of like, it doesn't matter if it started by one person, it's harder to kind of like, to then share it with somebody. Um, but so, um, yeah, I think like, it, it's about the intention of how you want to run the organization. So I was talking to Johnny that, you know, you, you, can, you can be a co-op just like, as long as eventually you hire some other people as well. <laughs> and, uh, and like, there is this problem in cooperatives Kind of like that found called like this disease foundritis, and that the founders uh, kind of like have more democ kind of like authority or something just because they started it. So to kind of like we were we, uh, me and Simon were kind of like thinking like okay we we don't want this disease when others join. So we gave the co-op uh, a debt um, that it has to repay to us for unpaid work that we put in to start it. So um, yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but like I, I imagine, Johnny, it was quite difficult for you to like it, because it, it took a while to turn it into a cooperative, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because yeah, very active in in the co-op sector, um, and yeah, like I come back to kind of being a small organization and being like a group of founders. I think we operated as a co-op, but we just didn't have a formal institution. Um, and yeah, you said you were going to mention this tonight when we talked in the prep, but we, we had an office fire, a whole floor of our office building burnt down in 2017 or 18, 18, 18. Um, so two summers ago and, um, that, that kind of, that was a good kind of release on a lot of different things in terms of the business. But one thing we, we, yeah, we really did after that was kind of like set up a kind of formal cooperative constitution um and you know it, for us it's meant that we've been able to work with a lot of other co-ops um and we'll probably mention of course co UK today in terms of working with like the national federation body as a member um it's something that they prioritize um and you know obviously co-op supporting co-ops is a kind of one of the one of the main principles so we've talked about the kind of values and motivations the kind of the why um Obviously, you know, we can jump into the challenges, but I just thought a kind of positive way of looking at the beginning of, of, of both of your stories. Um, what was the most important thing to you, kind of personally and, and on an organizational level at the beginning of this journey? Like, what's the thing you couldn't have done without? Uh, for us, we were really lucky in, in, in West Yorkshire. There's lots of, um, there's like a network of people that we, we, we so happened to meet and got to know. So um, we had access to cooperative, proper cooperative consultancy on a kind of informal 
uh, pro bono basis and they helped us then to guide us through to get funding to pay for the work they were doing so that kind of continued so that was really helpful I think because we were starting it from fresh and also the, the we had we were on a program Pay for it. sorry we uh, it was I think it was probably the hive or uh, I think um, uh, bits of cash here and there that we managed to get um, so that the was hive, before hi the hive was a thing um, wasn't it? Yeah, like, it, it was all gen, wasn't it? I'm sure we've had money out of the hype. We've had money out of most places by now. <laughs> so the way when it started, but you know, we got a, it started by that pro bono, and it was a lady called Kath Mulner, uh, Leeds Co op Kath. Many, many of you may know her, and she we just knew her, so she's helped us out get everything set up. So, so that was uh, you obviously that was really helpful meeting someone locally we had access to to give us that initial guidance and expertise. Yeah, did you, did you, so what, one of the issues around the co-op sector that we kind of, that we've experienced and that we really acknowledge is the kind of lack of funding around business support. Um, so for example, the way that, that we perceive it is that there's other business sectors such as, such as the community business sector, which is supported by an, at least originally 150 million pound endowment from the national um, lottery. There's a lot of business support programs um, employee ownership has support um, and social enterprise has got quite a mature kind of business support infrastructure around it. One thing that we really suffer from in the co-op sector is the lack of, is the lack of business support um, in a kind of funded way. The Hive who are sponsoring this evening's event are one of the only, yeah, one of the only real kind of providers of free um, business support. And really competitive. And, and it's very competitive and you've got to be at a particular stage of business development. Mm. So it's not very good for kind of early stage inquiries such as, you know, we've got this idea, can you, can you support it? It's more for people that are kind of a, you know, business registration stage, a fundraising stage, looking to use things like, um, yeah, community shares and so on. Um, because yeah, in, in, in our case, our development's been very organic most of our support's been unpaid and I'd, I'd probably say pro bono. Um, and that's from a kind of aging advisor base, um, which is very kind with its time. Um, I think most of us have probably shared similar advisors, people like Sean Wellens and Nathan Brown across the years, um, but it's been a relatively small group of advisors that have been motivated to really support young co-ops um, and before kind of passing on within Stir to Actions work that's something that we're really we've been looking at for the last year which is how do we build a new generation of advisors to support new interest and new appetite for setting up youth co-ops and it's you know it's an expensive process um, but it's something that we need to do better um, and it's something we need to be more active in um, as, the, as the current kind of co-op development culture is is relatively passive. I think I, I would say it's the first point of call if uh, it's find one of them co-op consultants uh, and if you don't have any in your area contact there's Nathan Brown on the, in the south isn't there and there's Mark Simmons in the north and they'll direct you to someone and in my experience they will help you for free to get you going and then get, send you in a direction and then there's a reason why I'd like to see some kind of youth co-op network so you can join for free and you can get this kind of signposting uh, the other place you can go of course is Corps UK which give a, a one year's free membership but you do have to qualify in the, their criteria of being a cooperative to get there so it's like the sooner you speak to someone who can help you get registered the sooner you can get your membership to Corps UK the sooner you can get other types of sorts of signposting and support and join get more involved in the network so yeah, and, and you've just mentioned network, so I don't know, you ever looked like she was just about to jump in, maybe with something else, but um, yeah, yeah, but do you want to go? Uh, just in terms of support, um, uh, the, the available support, um, there is plenty of like startup incubators um, in like different industries, industry specific, uh, all around the country. Um, and a lot of them are super useful in how to run a generic uh, business. Um, uh, I uh, went through Princess Trust, like I was, uh, so I was really broke when we started. Like uh, I first client meetings, I walked uh, 
like an hour <laughs> to because I couldn't afford a bus ticket at the time. Um, so, but like we, we got support from like things like Princess Trust who were helping um, young people um, in, in these situations and uh, lots of other incubators that were free and like had like a bit of support uh, here and there. The, the one issue with these um, uh, programs was that nobody understood cooperatives and actually actively tried to convince us to not bother because it's a, uh, they thought it was more difficult to run a cooperative. Um, so we were really lucky to come across Sean Wellens uh, that um, Johnny mentioned, who helped incorporate us and kind of like did a lot of the, this kind of like uh, um, support, supported us to transition from a very kind of like competitive um, mindset that we kind of like got from university and from working in, in the industry and to kind of like transition into more cooperative ways of working and thinking. Um, but yeah, so so it's like, it, it's there is a lot of support to start that is still useful out there outside of cooperatives, but it's very important to have like, for us, it's been super important to have a, a mentor who has kind of like done it um, themselves and uh, also a peer network um who were going through the same journey at the same time that that was completely invaluable what did they yeah. say nothing nothing worse worth doing is comes easy and that's typical of the cooperative model and what you really what we really need is people go yeah the cooperative thing's quite difficult but by the way if you can do it it's got all these benefits um which perhaps be interesting to talk about as well yeah and in, in, in terms of peer support um Obviously, solidarity, cooperation amongst co-ops is, is kind of like an absolute basic principle of the movement. Um, and we're all members of either active or kind of passive of a few different cooperative networks. Um, so, yeah, the first time that I met Martin and Yeva was at a young cooperators network meeting in London. Um, we were in the Can Mezzanine, uh, which is in Borough in South London. Um, and it was being hosted by an organization called AltGen. AltGen um, don't currently exist, um, but had a really big impact and influence on young adult co-ops, kind of between, I'd say, 2015 and kind of 2017, 2018, um, which involved a lot of work going into universities, to job fairs, a range of conferences, and really trying to build more and more political and financial support um, for young people starting co-ops both internally to the co-op sector and externally going out and doing that kind of engagement and, and outreach work. Um, yeah, Martin, Yeva, do you want to talk a bit more about, I mean, yeah, maybe I go to Yeva because you kind of worked alongside AltGen, yeah, for a time and know a bit more about kind of their work, but yeah, could you talk about AltGen and what that inspired and kind of stimulated back in 2015, 16? Um, yeah, so um, when we were starting out, uh, we applied for, we saw these, this uh, kind of uh, campaign, uh, all gen, and uh, we really liked uh, their stickers um, and posters that were saying, don't climb the ladder, and uh, it's not you, it's the economy, and uh, just kind of like dealing with that kind of like a lot of the shame that we didn't make it in the, in the industry, and that maybe we weren't good enough, kind of like, it was like really inspiring to see other young people who were kind of like actually uh, it's not all like because we saw everyone around ourselves struggling um it wasn't just us it, there were things like kind of like working against us and just that sort of kind of uh, it gave us a lot of kind of determination and kind of like this kind of collective energy um and we applied um for the program but we didn't get it uh, we kind of like just saw it very close to deadline and we weren't ready to apply for it but um quickly tell us about the young cooperators prize what the offer was and yeah so they were um they they had 30 applications and they selected five to support with uh, um like a week-long retreat um where they would go for a program of starting a cooperative and they would have um cooperative advice etc i think they martin you got like two grand like and all the other groups who won the <laughs> competition was it two grand um, was it five grand it was a good chunk of money actually 
Five, five grand. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. A good twist to this tale because Yever, Yever and Blairhouse didn't get qualified, but they, they, it were in all the impact reports. Just, um, just, Yever and Simon decided to gate crash the workshop weekend and they just not quite, not, not quite, impact, which you were welcomed into. But you, I just that's how I remember you were like, Oh, so you're, you, you're not part of it. Oh, no, we've got space, you can, you can get involved. And um, so we know that there is like there is this event that is happening every year, which is Worker Cooperative Weekend, where all the worker That's cooperatives right. around the country get together um, in some like place. There is usually campfire, lots of alcohol from Suma, and uh, lots of singing and uh, and like lots of like kind of like rants and uh, good conversations. And we showed up that we like we were like <laughs> like we had a car that was like on its last legs, um, kind of like bumper, uh, kind of like sticked with duct tape, and like we got a flat tire on the way. So we showed up in the middle of the night in Oxfordshire, I think it was, and we were kind of like super awkward. Like went in and like and Tatiana and Anna from Ceramic Studio Cooperative like spotted us and was like, oh, you're young. Because at that time that was kind of like a new, like a strange thing to see in a cooperative circles. So they were like, what are you doing here? And we're like, oh, we, we would like to start a cooperative. So they invited us to the to the young bit of the of the camp um and uh, they were like oh whilst you're here you may as well you know stick around with us um so yeah that's kind of how um and just to pick up one of the questions about what is young so in our young so uh, during that um uh weekend we uh, started young cooperators network uh, so all the, because like we were all peers uh, etc so we had a person, I, I think Dan was 50 at the time, one of the people in our Young Cooperators Network. Yeah, so the, the, the thing is, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's very varied of what qualifies like um, as young, like for us in the UK, um, we considered our network to be quite radical. So we're like, you must be young to cooperation, to cooperatives. Like you either have to start a, a cooperative or like, um, be like young as a as an age, or um, or just kind of like uh, yeah, whoever really who who like who wants to be part of that journey. Uh, in in Italy, for example, a young cooperator qualifies until they're forty. Um, in the rest of Europe, it's until you're thirty five. That's the kind of like yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and it's interesting because I think a lot of youth charities in the UK are kind of basing young adults kind of 18 to 24 um, and I think it's really interesting doing work with young people because yeah that that's become more and more meaningless in terms of kind of property ownership um, work employment a whole range of kind of indicators of quite what it means to be an adult and um, there's this kind of generational lapse in the kind of language and concept of quite what that means and therefore yeah, if you're beyond a particular age in terms of kind of statutory legislation in the UK, then you kind of fall off this, yeah, this cliff edge and there's no support and there's no infrastructure and you find it really, really difficult to access um, any kind of support. And I think generally within Certo Action, you know, we kind of go 18 to 30, 18 to 35. Um, we designed and delivered a programme in Lambeth in South London last winter. Um, and that went out and we, we weren't too specific on the age range, but we, we tended to find that most of the people that applied were older than 25 and kind of were generally just kind of circling around 30 um, in terms of signing up to that. Um, so the Young Cooperators Network um, is a kind of dormant passive network at the moment. What another part of kind of having this evening event tonight has been conversations that some of the founding members have been having, I guess, just after lockdown and seeing if there's kind of any more inspiration to, to, um, to restart, to revive it. And part of our ideas, just in case anybody um, on the call tonight is interested, we're, we're looking to, yeah, to get a Young Cooperators Prize funded again, kind of as a, you know, as a kind of, um, yeah, as a kind of COVID related resurgence for young adult co-ops in the UK. Um, and again, that would be, like Martin said, a kind of seed fund 
residential retreat program of support and mentoring that can really support a new cohort, hopefully more than five. We can be ambitious this time around, get more like 10, 15, 20 funded um, to start their journeys with a really good bit of kind of like wraparound support from the start. Um, yeah. Yeah, and also we discussed that we, you know that that we don't really have the so what happened it fizzled out basically we kept it going after the first cohort and then we the same group stuck together and then everyone visited Bradford everyone visited London and we didn't really get it off the ground but that same group of people are still there um, Dan Sofa from Founders and Coders fifty years old by the way he's surrounded by young people which is you know that is most of his he's older people. now. He's even older now, but Dan Sofer said that he's been waiting under his tree, waiting for the next cohort of young people to arrive. Where you know, and the whole idea of the Corporate's network always was a kind of peer mentor network. Um, and I'm kind of excited to see who else is in the room and open it out a little bit and start a little bit of a dialogue between. Um, everyone uh, and with that in mind and, and whether people would be interested in um, some format be it or another being involved in a network and, and helping and being involved in something. Um, yeah maybe we could um, hey, say hello to Sim just in your comments Sim hope you're well. Um, so you're in a student housing co-op in Brighton. Um, last year yeah some producers from a company working for the BBC got in touch at their GCSE bite size um, and Sim had been on one of our residentials um, in the summer so we got in touch and it's great that yeah um, the BBC did a kind of little three minute video at Sim's housing co-op in Brighton but Sim would you would you like to jump on and kind of talk about the members of your housing co-op and do they, are they in other co-ops have they got their own businesses do they want to do they need support yeah sure um I'm happy to talk about that. And also, yeah, thanks for setting me up with that BBC video. That's so cool to look at. Um, so young people um, and co-ops. Um, like I've known about co-ops for five years, maybe. So I feel maybe like I'm not even a young person, even though I'm 23. Um, but, okay, so I think the first thing to say is I think a lot of student housing co-ops especially the newer ones who are unhoused, um, find it hard when um, older members leave or graduate to bring new members in. Um, and I think that's happened in a couple of cities around the UK. So here in Brighton, we really wanted to make sure that that didn't happen and spent most of our time over lockdown kind of bringing new members in and talking to them. Um, the issue with that is, um, is that being part of a co-op is so much work like it it comes it, like we advertise it alongside other student societies but it's literally a business that you're running um and and that yeah i think that surprises a lot of people um it's amazing because you know um it's it's flat working structures and all of that um but yeah that that's that's been hard um so we kind of had to advertise quite widely and even put up like adverts on, on like our career hub, our universities and um, job websites thing um, to, to try and look for people with the capacity to be doing this. So, so actually a lot of our new members, we've got eight new members now, um, like very few of them have experience with co-ops or maybe they have a friend in another city in a student housing co-op or they're part of a social centre or something like that. But, um, yeah, I, none of them could make it today because, um, funny enough, they're applying for jobs. Um, but yeah, just to say that, like, it's been really fun to share my enthusiasm about co-ops with a bunch of people younger even than me. Um, <laughs> say again. I said you found. It. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't a tree, but. All the same, in a little box of faces, we're all here. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, um, so I think it's, yeah, it's really interesting just in terms of, just to kind of explain that a bit more about, I guess, what you might call a more kind of intuitive cooperative culture. 
Um, and obviously being in a society where the default is, like you ever said earlier, competition. Um, yeah, you know, getting that culture right. But, you know, co-ops aren't just business entities. You know, they, they have group dynamics, they have cultures. Um, and it's obviously a constant and conscious kind of effort to, to build those relationships as best as possible. And we often start from a place where it's not been encouraged for the majority of our lives. And we suddenly have to make not only a business work and trade um, and provide jobs for people and livelihoods, but also make that, that, you know, that framework, you know, actually work. Um, do you, have you got any tools that you use? What does induction look like? We haven't really talked about kind of, you know, we'd say there's recruitment and there's taking people on and there's getting new members, but yeah. Is anybody from Sim to Yeva to Martin got anything on kind of tools around induction and kind of, yeah, how you kind of bring people in and, and get them to land in the co-op um, so that they can kind of meaningfully participate? To be honest, from our point of view, we're still working out the cooperative bit. <laughs> Even though we've been running formed five years ago, so we we operate as an ordinary business does and we're kind of doing best we can um, in terms of recruitment and good practice and all of that things. It, that, and then um, the cooperative bit and membership bit and participation bit uh, in terms of our governance, we're, we're we're still figuring that out really. Um, so it's really not an easy path to take and um, in our experience, but you've just got to kind of follow it. And again, I think it comes to peer support. Um, if you can find any support you can get in terms of development, um, organizational development is helpful in that regard. Yeah, I think that's a really good point around organizational development. It's often really difficult to invest in your own organization, that kind of time and resource to, to get things right kind of internally on the kind of inside of your, of your co-op often. But it's something that, um, yeah, that's so important and something that we at Stir to Action are trying to do more and more and more of, get the governance better, get the AGMs better, the general meetings better give lots of notice and kind of advance notes to people so they can really, really participate in the kind of overall kind of running of the business. Um, but I think maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe you're kind of alluding to it, Martin, that another part of it is also finding out in what ways people want to participate in your co-op and people will do that in different ways. And there's no single formula for everyone to be a cooperator in one single sense. And I think it's kind of looking at it and just saying, people will personally develop over time and want to take on new levels of responsibility or new, you know, tasks and roles within the co-op. And I think that's, you know, that's a lesson that I think everybody learns from starting with, you know, a very kind of idealistic position about full participation to actually realizing that, you know, everybody's an individual and everybody has a life outside of your co-op that pre puts pressure on them in, in different ways. And, um, yeah, allows them to behave in different ways. Um, we like uh, so. Um, we initially started as a production, video production company uh, cooperative, and uh, for the first year, we didn't uh, really earn anything. We were working other jobs uh, to like pay rent, etc. Like in cafe, I was working in a cafe uh, and restaurant, and Simon was working in a. Uh, corporate production, video production company, uh, editing luxury uh, flat development videos, um, and <laughs> and uh, getting demoralized. Um, so uh, we initially, like after the first year, we started making a bit of money, and we were able to start paying ourselves a living wage, a London living wage. And uh, for the next few years, we because we never took out loans. We were kind of like also like terrified of like taking out loans. And like, I was generally terrified of banks. Um, and um, uh, we kind of uh, just like, we, we didn't have enough money to hire others. So we did everything ourselves. Um, and, uh, and then eventually when we saved up enough money to pay somebody secure, like to, to take on somebody 
with like three months in advance that we could cover their wages. It took a while for us to like build up that reserve to like feel like we can hire someone and give them a sense of security, even though at our own expense in a way. Um, so, um, but eventually we kind of like our, like we, we became sustainable and kind of uh, started like increasing our wages, etc. But uh, one big lesson for us was that we um, initially we hired for roles, uh, like if for for people to do a specific job that we didn't want to do. <laughs> so we were trying to find like people who were interested in certain things to do them, and that never really kind of like worked out. I think. Um, and then eventually, instead of hiring for roles, we just hired people for them, like for the being them. And I think that worked out really well. And the last two people that we hired, um, uh, we kind of like uh, one of them moved uh, on with uh, working with something else. Um, but we still work sometimes on freelance basis together. And another person is now um, uh, is like on a path to become a member. Um, and uh, we, in a way, it was a weird contract because we didn't give them a job description. We were like, we trust you that, like, we kind of like had enough trust that what they were is gonna, like, we're gonna make some stuff <laughs> up, you know? It's like, we're gonna make what happen. And, and instead we're just kind of like, and we do all sorts of jobs. Like it's uh, like, it, it, it's really varied, like, uh, one day we might think of like creating this or another day that and uh, and we just make it happen and uh, one thing that we um struggle with in terms of industry because um in creative industry industries we rely on people having very like big specialisms so we weren't able to like we have a lot of freelancers that we work with we have about 10 regular freelancers that for some of them were like some of the biggest kind of employers during the year um and um but because it's a freelance because like sound mix or like a color grade is only like we only need it a couple of times a month and it varies when we can't employ them on a regular contract so there is this um thing great thank you Eva. and so just to go back to sim quickly as well and so are you part of any student housing co-op networks? I know there's student homes. In terms of your, yeah, developing your student housing co-op, what support was available from informal peer support, someone jumping on the phone through to more formal support through, you know, programs and, and, and funding and so on? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, yes, we have the, the network, um, student co-op homes. Um, like I think I had met um, someone who I ended up setting up a uh, seesaw with um, a couple of years before we set it up um, at one of these events, which was really cool. Um, and like more recently, we've been talking to groups in Glasgow and Bristol, um, who are much um, who are kind of further back in terms of setting up. Um, but I think we've had a lot of support from our local community land trust. Um, uh, and in the beginning, they helped fund a, um, like an administrator role, an enabler. Um, and that was so incredibly helpful, um, just to have someone stable, someone who could go away and like do some work, because obviously it's a housing court, none of us are being paid. Um, it's more just that hopefully at the end, someone will have cheaper rent. Um, but so, so we got a lot of support from the Community Land Trust, um, and yeah, kind of local networks um, like mutual aid in Sussex, um, other people in housing co-ops. Yeah, um, there was like a business incubator um, at the university in fact, but we never approached them because they, they didn't have a lot of experience with co-ops um, and it felt like that might just confuse things a lot more. Um, but I just wanted to go back to your question before this, which was kind of um, how do you how do you kind of bring new members in and what the word I'm use, induct is it um, in, induct them yeah and 
like I totally agree with what you said. Um, every every new member who comes in brings something so different to the role. Um, and so like like in in the most recent handbook where I wrote down like all the things that need to be done, um, I like to just keep it to the bare minimum, like things that we need to do as an organization to survive, um, and make sure that those are done. But like every single person who comes is studying a different degree, does a bunch of different extracurriculars and um like designs new things or speaks to new people or or um writes for us. Um and yeah, it's just amazing to kind of get hold of that. And so obviously that's been hard over lockdown, um, not meeting people IRL, but um but I think the like single biggest thing that helped us um kind of induct new members is just being a friendly face and like remembering to laugh and um ask, asking people about their lives and what else they've got going on um like just being grateful for people to show up and saying you know e even if you've got a lot going on right now and you can't contribute very much in the meeting that's fine um like we appreciate you being here um because because now we've got a whole bunch of like really committed volunteers who care about the project and 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 hopefully we'll get to live in the house but I'm, I'm sure people some people won't get to live in the house because they would have graduated and moved on by the time it actually gets set up um but yeah i just wanted to throw that in there yeah no thanks a lot that's great sim um is, just, to, just ask him quickly yeah. is, there a, is there a student housing co-op network established and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's affiliated with Co-ops UK. It's called Student Co-op Homes, um, and they uh, raised a whole bunch of money earlier this year um, to buy a house, I think, in Nottingham and Glasgow. Um, we were third on their list, um, but uh, we're not going to manage, so we're partnering with our local CLT um, here to buy us a house. And, and do they offer you any support, like a, like a secondary co-op type support package, like? Yeah, so so they kind of make up the same people as the local um, community led housing enabler hub. Um, and so kind of any questions that we've got, really, um, we can go to them. Good. That said, sometimes it's conflict of interest because we will have kind of a long term lease with them. Um, so I try to kind of get in touch with other na like networks nationally. Um, so so a lot of the time that would be um, other student housing co-ops who are further ahead in the process than we are, um, like Birmingham, Edinburgh, um, Nottingham. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. You're not alone, then. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, we have one policy that uh, I think we nicked uh, from Calverts or Sue might, I can't remember now, but um, that any new person who is en route to become a member needs to uh, go to um, Worker Co-op Weekend uh, to spend three days mixing with all the people in kind of like from Worker Co-ops in the UK usually does the job. They need to test your blood. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to get policy check like you. that passed for us. <laughs> check you the real deal. <laughs> I'm just looking at a question here from from Ben. Hi Ben. Um, we've been in touch. You recently subscribed to the magazine, so so thanks for that. Um, yeah, talking about like young people and kind of after school stuff. In, interestingly, I kind of I feel like a lot of my work is reminding co-ops that they're not just governance bodies and that they are actually businesses. And this kind of goes back to what you ever said, you can actually get loads of free business support to run a really good business. In terms of how you govern it, yes, you need kind of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, specialist support for that, and you should definitely kind of seek that out. But I think equally, I think with young people, I think the idea of using cooperative governance just to run events, so, you know, kind of using cooperative governance, maybe to set up an after-school club and decide what that club's going to be. Um, and allow people to kind of like, you know, use decision-making practices, getting people used to using democracy essentially, which comes back to this idea of the default in our society is so often competitive that any opportunities that we can give people as young as possible to do, you know, just to operate simple governance tools about how they decide what to do with, maybe with small budgets, 
maybe with time, maybe with different um, priorities. I think it's just a really, really good exercise that young people could, could be doing really, really early on. And again, this comes back to skill development, personal development, which will, should they start a business kind of in later life that it can really, really contribute to. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of that. And I don't think we do enough of that in terms of like, forget the business, forget the trading bit. Let's just use this as a governance model to kind of allow people to, to kind of experience that. Yeah, was just posted about Woodcraft Folk. If you don't know about Woodcraft Folk, they were started in the, in the 1910s or 20s, maybe 20, yeah, 1910s or 20s. It's kind of alternative to the Scouts, um, alternative to kind of more militaristic scout movement um as a more kind of like peace and cooperative movement um and yeah they have regional regional initiatives all over the uk they're denser in different parts of it but um yeah take a look at woodcraft folk in terms of cooperative culture interesting the amount of let's call them kind of social activists or social campaigners that i've spoken to that went to woodcraft folk when they were younger um it's quite interesting in terms of how it's just how they're kind of early personal development. Are there any more, are there any questions? Does anybody wanna unmute themselves and jump in with a, with a question? Got about 20, 25 minutes left. If someone would like to jump in. Yeah, I'll jump in. Hey, Caleb. Um, hey, have all of, all three of your endeavors been kind of slow on the well just quite a lot of sweat equity and then not a lot of um kind of uh weight steady wages does it sound well it definitely sounds like johnny and martin's yours was quite uh sounds like it was like that but yeah just any reflections on that i guess yeah i mean just to jump in I think like any business, when you're starting it, you're working other jobs. So I worked a lot of other jobs. I worked at a care home, um, factory work, lots of different kind of like temping agency jobs. Um, but I don't think that's too different from, from most people setting up businesses, to be honest. Um, in, terms of, in terms of kind of wages and supporting, um, yeah, kind of started as self-employed. Um, and then then became an employee later on. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think any, starting any business is always sweat equity and you ever might expand on it, but um, actually I'm, I'm, I'm still paid a bonus um, because, because I started the co-op um, when other people came on board and became directors. And, um, basically we, we agreed that, um, I would get a bonus for the next five years, um, quite a small nominal amount of £3,000 a year, £15,000 in kind of unpaid wages, which didn't nearly represent the amount of loss of earnings that it took me to, to start the co-op. But it was amazing kind of how enthusiastic the new directors were to, to basically be like, we need to make this happen. We need to sign this off. We need to get this kind of as a, you know, as something that's agreed by the directors and stuff. And that's great, I think, when, when you're starting a business and it is a really useful way and a useful tool for you to kind of, yeah, open up and detach a little bit from that kind of, that founderitis that, that you ever mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, but do you want to talk a bit about, oh, Martin's going to jump in. I am. Uh, our experience of starting up, uh, me and my mates, uh, all doing our own thing and starting to jobs collectively to uh, setting up a community centre of a cafe and a staff. Our staff bill is now like £10,000 a month, which is kind of a lot of money for us. And we turn over £300,000 a year. And it's a mixture of people who are freelancing and basically subcontracting who are members. And we took a cut off the top of that, which goes into the central coffers and people who are staffed um, working the cafe. Um, and one of, one of the things we've recently moved away from is having a non-hierarchy of pay. Um, we started like that because we were leading by example. Um, but what we realised is we just can't, when you want to get a business manager in, you need to pay them more money. And um, unfortunately, our cooperative isn't in a position to pay everyone £12 or £15 an hour. 
um, which in Bradford just about gets you a, a decent business manager um, who's probably coming down from much more than that. So basically, that's one of the things I would suggest uh um, whether you believe in a non-hierarchy pay or not, if you're starting up, you need some sort of uh, hierarchy of pay. And we we made that equ- we, we we've done a system to make that fair and equal by creating tiers. Um, so uh, my role is a coordinator. So all coordinators get paid in a certain pa- uh, money bracket, um, uh, which is around about ten pound an hour. Uh, we have we have business managers. We've got two business managers, and they get paid a little bit more, four pound an hour. And then everyone else is um, on a minimum wage, but then we give like bonuses every year you work and if you take an additional responsibility. So, so it means that everyone gets paid fairly, not equally. Um, by the way, I also work at Sumer Whole Foods, which is the biggest flat paying uh, worker cooperative in Europe. Uh, in fact, is it the biggest flat paying business in Europe? Someone might be able to credit. So I get, and I get paid fifteen pound an hour for working in that with everyone else. So, but Sumer is uh, a very profitable and sustainable business that can do that um, and has held on to those principles. Um, I would suggest it's a tricky route to. <laughs> you've got some good money coming in to pay everyone and build it that way. Um, but anyway, that's my experience. Hopefully, that's a helpful observation, Caleb. Um, I guess um, for us, um, we, as I said, um, we started by um, with sweat equity, then moved on to living wage, and we had a very good advi- early advice from like our business advisors to double our prices, and when we doubled them, he also told us to double them again, <laughs> and so like as, as we build up confidence and experience, we kind of like. Um, Kind of like got our rates up um, and built uh, like um, like it, more kind of uh, b- bigger and international institutions started like commissioning us and uh, um, so at the moment uh, we have like um, flat pay structure um, and uh, it, it, we uh, pay just like an annual salary I don't know pay pay way. Um, uh, which is like 30 uh, grand a year. Um, Good year. Yeah. Good effort. That's an amazing organization to be a member and a, a, a employed by, where everyone gets paid 30 grand a year. Really um, impressive. It, it took a while, but um, yeah, I guess like the industry in which we are in as well is quite um, in demand, so mm-hmm. it helps. Great, thank you. We got a question from Stephanie Bolt. Hey, Stephanie, saying, has anyone done a co-op model for the kickstart scheme, i.e. kind of apprenticeships? Might anybody? Um, So we've got a sister co-op. So we took on a lease on a residential training centre in Mid-Devon in March, a week before lockdown. Don't laugh. Um, Fortunately, on a peppercorn lease for five years. and that our, our sister co-op, which I'm a director, um, yeah, is, is, is basically part of a consortium of Rio, which is an organization down in Plymouth. Because um, as people are probably aware, you had to apply for a minimum of 30, 30 places and take on 30 people. So people have been using the kind of consortium model um, to do that more broadly. Um, yeah, more broadly, I don't know what the rest of the co-op sector is doing. I saw that Martin was was shaking his head or oh, not. Well, just a point. So I'm I'm I was recently elected to represent uh, enterprise-owned cooperatives on the board of Co-ops UK, um, which someone <laughs> kindly invited me to do, and then I went and did it. So I was like, "Whoa, I'm on the board of Co-ops UK. That's cool." So um, and and that. Just I shook my head because I realised that we had a board meeting today, and that completely isn't on the radar. And I presume it will be on the management team, but it, you know, strategically, Co-ops UK um, ought to be supporting co-ops in doing that. Certainly, established co-ops in how they can manage and create more opportunities for young people through that scheme. 
uh, be interested to hear anyone else if anyone else has got any observations of, of working on a local level of on the Kickstart program. And, and, and um, I'm, did you want to jump on and say something? Because I saw your your comment as well about kind of placements in the co-op college. And we've, we've been talking to the co-op college recently. Um, as, yeah, some people might be aware, but there's a 90 million pound dormant asset fund um, called the Youth Futures Foundation, which is all about getting to the root causes of youth unemployment. Um, and so we're kind of working with co-op college and co-op UK at the moment about, yeah, kind of thinking about what a bid might look like um, into that fund. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Stephanie, if you wanted to jump on and say anything, if not, no worries. No, I'm just, yeah, wow, 90 million. That's that's a good amount. Um, yeah, no, we're, I'm just really, I mean, Daniel Cox, who some of the people on this call have, have met and spoken with is just amazing. And we're, we're kind of exploring different models of culturally situated apprenticeships within cooperatives. Um, I'm in Wales, so I have Wales Corp Development Centre. Um, and just really interested in you know, the questions around Kickstart, which is to do with reframing you know, what the UK government think of as a work placement to start with. Um, and whether if Martin you know, was interested, I think there's discussions going on at co college about some kind of resource that is specific for you know, learning to be a cooperator within these contexts to support cooperative development across co-ops UK wide. So thanks, Johnny. I wasn't aware of those discussions, but I am now. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Yeah, any more questions? Have we got anybody else who might want to jump on and yeah, maybe not a question, maybe more of a statement or I just um Thank you. It's been been brilliant listening to you all. But Martin, you mentioned power to change and balancing um, community and co-opy stuff to talk in talking to power to change. Could you just expand on that a bit more? Uh, yeah, well, it was just a simple thing of um, our members previously were our uh, associates and our staff. So anyone who was freelancing for us could therefore become a member and also anyone working for us could also be a member so like a kind of typical well consortium initially, and then we had staff but then we just added another type of member which is user member so if anybody's paying for the services of our uh, at bread and roses um that's not a cup of coffee that's renting a room or becoming a co-worker or joining the art collective or anything like that but they're paying for services then they're eligible for membership um, and that's the way, that's the route into membership. So they have route into owning the organization. So um, I, so as, that's how we've done it. It's just a mechanism of involving our community. Um, cool, and that's still like a work, it's like a worker coat rather than a community benefits society. Um, so we, well, we're a cooperative society. So we, we, but within our, we did a slight tweak to our mission, basically, which says that we have originally we were for the benefit of our members, which is what traditional work corp is. Um, but we just added plus the people of Bradford. Um, <laughs> and the, is that like a hybrid then? Because I never, that's, that's I, I'm, you know, I'm probably one of the oldest people here, but I only found out about community benefit societies last year. And since I found out about them, I've just been. Well, we've already decided was we're just going to basically do it in Colville, and we've just dedicated 15 years to see how many buildings that we can help the community take over. And people keep saying to me, "So, you know, what do you want to do?" And I don't want to do anything in any of these buildings. All we're gonna, all we're doing is connecting. And I think that's a role that's missing. It's this, the connecting and the amount of effort that goes into connecting people in the first place and inspiring and saying you can do it and providing the tools to set up small enterprises and projects that's what's missing and I genuinely have got no interest in doing absolutely anything in any of these buildings but we've got a pub that's going to be a community you know a, a creative hub we've got a massive cobalt market that's going to be an event space we've got all these different things and all of them are there for the taking we need to think really big but act really small and that's kind of what we're doing so it might help one person just change their mindset that's a win but eventually we'll take over one of those buildings and that'll be a massive win but the the amount of um enterprise the stuff that can be generated for the local community by doing it the cooperative way is so huge uh, and one of the tools we've helped 
developed with CAN, the Cooperative Assistance Network, is something called the Wicked Spreadsheet that we shared earlier on a workshop. And it can really show councils and owners of buildings what community ownership of spaces can do. So that's a bit of a mush of things. But if anybody's interested, we do have this Wicked Spreadsheet workshop. It's an open source community that is there to, there to share. But we're, we're basically doing it in Colville. So if anybody wants to visit Colville, and I'm, I'm going to chase up all these different contacts and, um, you know, get, get in touch with the college and try and just get everybody talking about CBSs. Because like, like eight, uh, it's not lever is it either just think it's crazy how come people don't know about this thing called a cbs it's just mad so we're going into primary schools colleges universities but just in colville area <laughs> and, then, and then quickly yeah just to follow up thanks for that dina um it's it's interesting it's really difficult to really go into some of the kind of <laughs> tensions between different legal structures but um lots of worker co-ops can self-describe as social enterprises um and cooperatives can, you know, can, you know, can be considered community businesses. Um, so Power to Change, for instance, have got kind of four approaches to what a community business is, and that's to be locally rooted, accountable to the local community, trading, trading for community benefit, et cetera. And so as a co-op, we work with, with Power to Change um, and receive funding and contracts from them. Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit of a minefield, but, um, often co-ops identify as social enterprises um, and you know and as community businesses too it all depends if you're place-based if you're locally rooted or if you're a national international business um, but it's um yeah it's, it's a really interesting space to kind of to navigate um, and obviously eligibility around funding we haven't spoken too much about funding um, one because there's not a huge amount of funding in the co-op sector as you've probably surmise from the kind of journeys that, that we've all had. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning community shares. So community shares are a form of withdrawable share capital, which are unique to societies. So both cooperative societies and community benefit societies. And they're basically a form of patient capital where local people or more regional or national can invest in your business, your initiative and become co-owners. There's lots of ways of structuring that. So you can have multi-stakeholder co-ops, which give more rights to particular people, i.e. the workers or the founders, um, compared with the investors. But community shares is quite a big market. Um, the now former CEO of Co-ops UK, Ed Mayo, wrote to the Times last year um, to say that 100,000 people have now invested in community shares. So it's quite a considerable um, yeah, it's quite yeah, it's quite a considerably big form of kind of democratic finance um, for it. So there's a kind of always a funding mix here, a kind of sweat equity, potentially loans. And like Yeva, we took out our first loan last year, and we had that same kind of nervousness about taking on debt. Um, but we, you know, our bit business was finally big enough to take on debt. To allow us to grow and do some different things and it was for a very kind of like specific project um but yeah if you want to find out more about community shares then um yeah we can we can put some in the kind of follow-up information um yeah there is a co community and cooperative finance uh, who uh, lend to cooperatives we actually did as well last year took out uh, a loan because we were um uh upsizing our studio um and needed some kind of uh to, to navigate our cash flow because uh, like we we often get paid after we're like with bigger institutions sometimes it takes half a year to get paid so um like it was really helpful for us access foundation the reach fund is called you can if you are looking to do community shares or attracting investment, which could be loan capital or share capital or any of them types. There's a thing called the REACH Fund, which will fund, it's an unrestricted grant for you to spend on the development. So we got 15 grand and we spent it on basically business and cooperative development. So under the premise that we were gonna then go and get more capital. So uh, that's, that's one route. Um, and for any established community businesses out there, or if you can define yourself as a community business in that you service, you're locally rooted, 
they, those people have some sort of democratic involvement, participation in your community, your business, um, your trading, and um, I forget the fourth one. Power to change is as a new fund uh, community or COVID bounce back or something like that, um, which is currently open and targeted specifically at, they're looking at um, groups from um, minority ethnic backgrounds and communities, and they're looking at organizations that are, um, have some sort of future leaders, uh, leadership involved in their, like embedded in their organization. So uh, that's the latest pot of money that's out there from Power to Change. Uh, and if, anyone, but, uh, if anyone is interested in power to change route, I'm happy to kind of tell you how I, my hacks, <laughs> that sort of thing. Just, just got a message from Sim. Sim, do you, do you want to quickly tell everybody about, um, yeah, your latest share offer to buy a house to, to lease to Cecil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's cool that you're talking about community shares because, um, yeah, um, like um, Cecil. It, um, the student housing co that I'm part of is um, partnering with our local community land trust and, and they're going to buy a house and um, have a long-term lease with us um, and we're raising money for it at the moment um, and it's it's got the the power to change um, accredited share offer thing um, oh. which kind of just do you know what that is like I've been told about it but I don't Fully understand it. Does that mean you'll get match funding? So is that with the community booster program? Um, like I think I think the meeting to to have to get it accredited was after the booster funding closed by like a week or something. So we didn't actually um, we weren't eligible for that, which is a real shame. But I've just seen a message that it might be open again. So I'm going to look into that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll pop the link into the chat um, if anyone knows any like, people or organisations who want to invest, um, they're based down in Brighton. Oh, thank you. Um, looks like Owen wants to jump in. Yeah, go for it. Hi. Interesting that every time people have, or, or most of the time I've jumped in on conversations, particularly national ones about co-ops, the two big things that come up are this word community, um, and the word funding <laughs> and, and trying to figure trying to navigate this and, and and I and I think that one of the strengths in the UK is is that there is this because of the lack of a fixed legal structure or a set of legal structures for co-ops it means that there are all these little combinations you can do and what that means is of course that in the definition of co-ops they're purposive organizations right so for the given purpose it's very context bound it's bound to the people who started it the people in the community it's set in and, and the purpose that it, that's been identified, whether that's social, cultural, political, or, or, or economic. Um, and all these different reasons can, can, can shape it. So in the, there's, there's all these different ways you can do it here, and that's brilliant. And in some ways, a network would help people guide, you know, help guide people through that. And I know that people like Sean Wellens and Bob Cannell, to an extent, and Kate Whittle, have developed ways of talking about these things in quite a simple way. Because otherwise, a group of people that are even remotely interested can all of a sudden become very overwhelmed. And even people that are really keen can become lost within the mire, you know, or miss tricks. So things that Martin did up in Bradford, somebody down in Brighton might not be doing, or somebody in Colville might not be doing. And there's all different ways that we can help each other. And therefore, the point of what I was just gonna say was to bring it back to this youth co-op thing is, and I'd like to sort of maybe bring it back to the three people who have been speaking this evening, um, what do you think the next action points are for building a scaffolding with the appropriate funding, et cetera, whatever, whatever you think is needed? What, what is the scaffolding we need to start preparing young people? And I mean, I mean the youth to become young cooperators and to navigate this, navigate and use this, this interesting structure to their advantage. Because, um, because I think there is potential there and you've all touched on your own journeys, but I'd really like to know from, from at the end of this presentation, which I know there's just a couple of minutes, what would be your kind of like three action points each or something like that? What's the scaffolding that we need next? Because you were all in the YCN and we had a great time, but I'd love to hear what your reflections are. 
Looks like Martin's finished his his three action points. So you go first. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say it's good. It's always good to have an academic in the room, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well said, Owen. Really, really kind of poignant. Um, scaffolding for young people to become youth cooperators and use this route for. I missed the end bit. It was like themselves use this well how to get youth to, to become to, to, oh, and, and and be able to use all of the different systems to their advantage you know and to, to create advantage them. that was the key part you went to their advantage absolutely um well there is one there's a number of things isn't there but um Ste stephanie mentioned the thing about the, the corpse college and doing educational programs i think that's that's good one and uh, by the way, Stephanie, because I know you're listening, I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, I'm here, yeah. <laughs> I like I like the idea of um, somehow getting that into the Corpse UK members. Corpse UK is made up of like uh, small guys like us, but then also big, big guys. And, and, you know, they must have young people. The Corp group must have young people who work in, in different roles in the organisation. They need training by the Corp Council to do that. And I think historically there has been that that has been a thing from Corp's, Corp's College have done. Um, the other thing that we have now introduced on the strategy or the operation strategy for 2021, um, Corp's UK didn't have anywhere on their policy or strategy anything around youth. Um, anyway, there's one small thing now that says they will explore a youth campaign in 2021. So like uh, you ever saw the cool stickers of Alt Gem, uh, that's basically what you know, we need a lot we need a cool sticker campaign um and then um and then the third part i think is is um uh it's uh called um the guy from it's, it's the it's, it's the founders of um the young cooperatives prize in 2015 which actually is in the picture behind yeva there we all sat around uh together uh, and then the new cohort, which which we've been waiting for for all this time, to somehow join us uh, and get to know us, and then establish a network. Um, that's been a really tricky thing for us. Yeah, that we've not got any money to do that. But um, there is the solid fund um, for Worker Court Council. That uh, the latest is they've got one hundred thirty thousand pound in that pot, so that could uh, do something. And uh, from this, I think I am going to. Um, set up a Lumio group for young cooperators today or tomorrow probably um, and the reason Lumio is another resource obviously but it's because the work the, there's Cortec and they've got that's where they use they and they've got quite an active group on there and then there's also the worker co-op weekend people and they're on Lumio too so um, if anybody's interested I'm going to set that up and Johnny if you could send the email out to invite send an invite like to people and then at least then we're all on some sort of digital place together where we can carry on sharing stuff. Great, I'll, I'll make mine quick just because we're, we're past nine. If anybody's got to go, then that's absolutely fine. No need to, no need to stay with us. But um, I think just talking to people that have been involved in the co-op sector, obviously public, public funding, you know, free training. You're talking about night classes, you're talking about study circles, a whole range of really, really useful, you know, forms of community education. And I think that will be a mix of kind of self-organized, self-directed, plus more formal um, institutional training. But, you know, we're looking, you know, I spoke to an advisor yesterday who, who started a co-op development agency called Case in 1984, the year that I was born. She was just like, everything under Thatcher was so much better than it is now. <laughs> and of course it was because there's been another 30 years of, of um, taking apart all public institutions and public realm and public sector and everything else. Um, but yeah, a lot of our work is educational programming and we've got like night classes that we're going to launch next year. Um, and we're looking to do a kind of national study circle um, program to support local people to set up study circles in their neighborhoods and work at that kind of neighborhood level and kind of build those relationships and build the ideas in a really kind of patient, um, self-organized way. Then of course, cultural exposure, you know, we've been talking about this kind of low exposure to co-ops. People don't know that co-ops are even an option. Um, and I think the way that we would do that and the way that we are doing that is through kind of like partnerships. So working with youth charities as a kind of cooperative partner to get access to the people they're working with and support the people they're working with. 
quickly, one of the really, really good stories that I love telling at the moment. Um, we've been working with a co-op developer called Mary Bautista, who's based in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she's a Mexican migrant, started working for the Center for Family Life probably about six or seven years ago. And they're a family center that provide relatively traditional services to immigrants in, that come into the city. So that's kind of, you know, resisting deportation. It might be getting children into local schools. Um, it might be a range of things. And employability was part of um, their kind of support that they offered. And in kind of 2011, 12, the board basically asked itself the question, we're sending vulnerable migrant, mainly women, something like 74% women, into low paid, insecure, low satisfaction workplaces. Um, what can we do to change that? And the board decided to look at co-ops. And that charity as a family, as a center for family services is now got a huge co-op development program. And I've been talking to Mary and she's way beyond capacity, but that's the kind of stuff that I'd love to see the co-op sector working with the third sector a lot more closely because they've been working around social services for so long, have those relationships and we need to work in partnership. I've even been kind of so modest to start saying, could co-op development be considered a social service in terms of the personal development offer it offers, the, the employment opportunity it offers? How about we start reframing that and work a lot more closely with, yeah, the people that meet, need co-ops the most and are often furthest from the support and, and knowledge about what they are and what they do. Sorry, that went on way too long. Um, yeah, but. Um, so, I don't know really. I think uh, like it's it's like one thing that is very interesting for me in the whole cooperative movement is how, like how we know how difficult <laughs> co-ops are to to you know to run in the world where like the culture is kind of like the opposite um, um, and success is kind of like described as the opposite and uh, but we you know spend our uh, Wednesday evenings um, staying past nine talking about how can we help each other to start more cooperatives so I think like in a way it's uh, like it, it massively changed things for me like uh, personally um, working in a cooperative, like it exposed me to incredible people. I made lifelong friends and, um, and it's like, uh, and, and because of this profound effect uh, that it had on me and people around me in my co-op and other co-ops that I kind of like, I'm not that shy about like preaching about them, but um, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of like, I'm, I'm kind, kind of like, um, I don't know what, how to build the scaffolding, you know, because like, I feel like we had so many meetings with, you know, with you and Martin and, and Johnny in the room, uh, uh, thinking of, uh, you know, how do we institutionalize something like a, a Young Cooperators Network? How, how do we have different cohorts taking it, uh, you know, forward? Um, and we haven't been able to, because we never had resource to do that and also because at the same time we were running our own cooperatives which is like more than a full-time job so um so it's difficult but like we kind of like you know once again here tonight still trying to figure it out take over the world <laughs> yeah thank you so much i think yeah we've taken up enough of people's time tonight i hope everybody found the kind of informal format kind of work for them. It's kind of, yeah, we've known each other for a while and we just kind of wanted to, to talk through, yeah, kind of, yeah, where we are and, and our kind of backgrounds in, in co-ops. Um, there will be a follow-up email. Um, we obviously have your email addresses and we'll obviously just use them to do some follow-up emails. Martin suggested that he'll set up a Lumio group. So it might be a few days just um, until we get back to you. We'll send a link to the video. If you know anybody that couldn't make it tonight or didn't know that they wanted to make it tonight and should should watch some of this, maybe you can watch it back and be like, yeah, watch 21 minutes to 29 minutes or something like that. You know, give them some, give them some clips to watch if they're not gonna sit through an hour and a half of, of us talking. But um, 
yeah, we're at Stairs of Action, we're going to be really supporting more and more kind of work around young adults and co-ops and we bring out a strategy kind of beginning of December, um, which is really going to um, foreground this work. Obviously, I want to say thank you again to Cops UK and The Hive. Um, like I said, this was about kind of reaching new audiences um, and has been sponsored by The Hive. Um, we will share information about the Hive and business support just in case you're on the call and you might be looking for um, some kind of support, you might be ready. If it's just like a general inquiry, then yeah, please do reply to that follow up email. Just drop us a line about what you're working on and we'll see if we can, yeah, give you any, yeah, give you any advice or any tips or where to look um, next. So yeah, thanks Yeva, thanks Martin, thanks to everybody um, for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, stay safe and speak soon.